Good morning, everyone. How are you? Uh, my name is Eric Black. I practice with Summit Medical Group right down the road in Florham Park, New Jersey. Um, so I, uh, unlike Dave, I'm, I'm a shoulder and elbow trained specialist. So all I do is take care of shoulders and elbows all day long. Um, so that allows me to kind of treat the spectrum of disease, including complex fractures, instability, rotator cuff tears. And a, a large part of my practice has to do with shoulder arthritis both non-operative and operative treatment. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the evaluation, how we manage these patients both without surgery and with surgery. And I think you'll find, and my, my goal today is to, to educate you on why I think shoulder arthritis is something that is very treatable. A lot of patients that come into my office, either from a referral from a primary care physician or they've talked to their friends and they say, you know, I have bad shoulder arthritis, but I heard shoulder replacements are terrible and they don't do well. And it's sort of an uphill battle for me to educate them on why I think they're actually a good candidate for, for, a, for an operation and why I think that shoulder replacements actually, contrary to many uh, people's beliefs, do extremely well. And I think it's the most rewarding part of my practice to, to treat pe people with end-stage arthritis of the shoulder and to perform shoulder replacements because uh, these are some of my happiest patients, more so than probably anybody else. So what we're going to talk about are the different flavors of shoulder arthritis. Uh, the way we treat them non-surgically, the way that we, we, we treat them surgically. So we'll talk about total shoulders, we'll talk about reverse total shoulders, the indications, a little bit about the techniques, some rehab, some outcomes, and, and, and a smattering of complications. And then if we have a, a couple of minutes at the end, we'll talk about some fractures and odd cases. So the shoulder is a very unique joint. As, as Dr. Epstein was mentioning, it's, it's a very interesting bony anatomy in that the ball is much larger than the socket. So I liken it to a golf ball on a golf tee. It's very little bony restraint, and there's the greatest amount of range of motion probably of any joint in the body. So our shoulder allows us to put our hand in space. And in order to do so, you have to have an incredible amount of of laxity and, and, um, and range of motion through that joint. So there's very little glenoid bone stock and there's a lot of soft tissue at work. So this is very different than the hip. There's, the hip is a ball and socket joint that has an incredible amount of bony restraint, whereas the shoulder has a very small amount of bony restraint. And in talking about that, it's important to understand the two differences because hip replacements, even though it's a ball and socket, is very different than a shoulder replacement. And then there's ligaments. The ligaments hold the shoulder in place, and these are important when we talk about different types of shoulder pathology, with, specifically with regards to arthritis. And then there's the muscles, which are the dynamic stabilizers, namely the rotator cuff, but also we can't forget about the scapula. The scapula is attached to the shoulder. It's attached to the shoulder socket, and there are many muscles that uh, are in play when we, when we talk about stabilizing the scapula. And this is just a perfect example of a person with a congenital problem who has essentially no muscular control of the scapula, and we're going to treat someone like her very different than someone who has a normal scapula. And so scapular rehabilitation is a very large part of how we treat shoulder problems in general, but specifically with shoulder arthritis. You can see she has profound uh, fascio-scapular muscular humeral dystrophy where she has essentially no muscular control of her scapula and essentially no range of motion of the shoulder as a result. So there's many different types of shoulder arthritis. The most common that we see and we treat is osteoarthritis of the shoulder. But then there's rotator cuff associated arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, post capsulorophy arthropathy, and avascular necrosis. We'll talk a little bit about each of these. So the most common is glenohumeral arthritis. So glenohumeral arthritis is a degenerative joint space narrowing. Essentially, you lose cartilage, and then the shoulder starts to degenerate over time. Um, it's very, in terms of specific problems with the shoulder, one of the most common things you'll see on an x-ray is a very large, we call it a goat's beard osteophyte. It looks like the beard coming off of a goat's face. So it's a large inferior humeral osteophyte, and typically these patients present with significant tightness in the front of their shoulder. So they have anterior tightness in the front, and that drives the shoulder out the back. And that's important because when we treat shoulder pathology, it's very specific to what we call posterior glenoid wear. So if this is the front of the shoulder right here on the left, you'll see that as we get tight in the front of the shoulder, it starts to wear out the back of the shoulder. And with time, what ends up happening is that the shoulder will start to subluxate out the back. So even the most significant of shoulder arthritic patients might not complain of shoulder pain in the front. A lot of them will complain that the back of my shoulder is killing me. They have a ton of pain through the scapula. And that's one of the most common things I see in some of the advanced arthritics that walk into the office. So they get, tend to get posterior glenoid wear, and that's important when we start thinking about how we reconstruct these problems.
So one of the biggest questions I get from patients and from primary care physicians, well, what about the rotator cuff in arthritis? If you look at the standard patient with glenohumeral osteoarthritis, the chance of them actually having specific, significant rotator cuff pathology is probably less than 3%. So oftentimes I'll see patients with arthritis that come into the office, they'd have seven MRIs and, um, to evaluate for a rotator cuff problem, when in reality they have arthritis. And arthritis is extremely uncommonly associated with rotator cuff problems. So the incidence of true rotator cuff pathology is rare. Even though when you get an MRI and you'll see a report that's 10 pages long and they mention the rotator cuff seven times, and then parentheses, they say glenohumeral osteoarthritis. If you look at the x-ray and it looks like this and it's horrendous arthritis and the patient comes to me with a referral for a rotator cuff tear, it's because the rotator cuff gets degenerative, but in reality it's not a functionally significant tear. The diagnosis isn't in fact that they have arthritis. This is contrasting to what you see on the right, which is what we call rotator cuff associated arthritis or rotator cuff tear arthropathy. So you can see the x-ray on the left has a large goat's beard osteophyte. The joint seems to be centered, but on the right, you'll notice that the joint, the ball and socket, the humerus is sitting up about three centimeters, and the humerus is rubbing under, against the undersurface of the acromion. This is a classic patient who has a large rotator cuff tear who has associated arthritis of the shoulder. And how does that work? So with chronic rotator cuff tears, you'll see that these patients will have tears of what's called the posterior superior rotator cuff. So the supraspinatus tendon is the most commonly torn rotator cuff tendon. And what happens as they raise the shoulder, the deltoid tends to pull the shoulder up so the humerus sublux nor subluxes north and they lose that centering force of the rotator cuff. So what ends up happening is they get anterior superior escape. They raise their shoulder and you'll see their shoulder will actually start to migrate north and erode into the front, into the top of the socket. So this is actually x-rays of a patient who's sequentially been followed with x-rays. You'll see on the top left, they start to develop rotator cuff arthritis, their shoulder is starting to sublux north, and then as time goes on, the ball will erode completely into the socket. So they have what's called fixed superior erosion of the shoulder, and essentially they come into the office and you say, raise your arm for me please, and you'll see their shoulder will kind of dislocate out the front, and that's exactly what it looks like when these patients will come in. So that's a very different flavor than the standard arthritic glenohumeral osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a whole other spectrum. So as we probably talked about yesterday, the rheumatoid arthritis is an erosive arthropathy where basically the inflammation of the body sets in and it erodes away the joint and soft tissues. So these patients, typically they'll see erosion on the, front, on the humerus and on the socket. You'll see what's called a periarticular erosion pattern. They typically don't have osteophytes or bone spurs and it can eat away the soft tissues including the rotator cuff. This in my practice, especially with immunomodulation and, um, and very smart rheumatologists, it really is not as much of an issue as it was even 10 years ago. So this is becoming less and less of a common thing we're seeing in shoulder replacements. These are the hardest patients to treat, post-traumatic arthritis, patients who have had fractures, injuries, surgery, uh, plates and screws, and all sorts of deformities. I think these are the most challenging ones to, ma uh, to manage. Uh, post capsulorphy arthropathy, so patients who have had instability, like Dr. Epstein was mentioning, people have dislocated their shoulder multiple times. Um, they've had either previous tightening surgery or no surgery. Um, and the, the, the trauma to their shoulder has caused them to have arthritis. These are also very challenging, and they're very young patients, unfortunately. And finally, avascular necrosis. So uh, basically, the humeral head loses its blood supply, supply. In the early stages, you'll see shedding of the cartilage and, small, and very isolated lesions to the humerus. And the late stages, you'll see erosive changes where the humerus basically disappears and you start getting significant arthritis in the glenoid. So how do these patients present? So when patients come to my office with severe arthritis, the first thing they, they tell me is that their shoulder hurts, it hurts at rest, and they can't move it. So they have pain at the extremes of range of motion initially, and then as time goes on, they start losing range of motion. You have them raise their arm and maybe they go halfway. As I was mentioning, they have pain posteriorly. They have mechanical complaints. Their shoulder will lock up on them. They're doing things and all of a sudden it feels like their shoulder dislocates. That's a common thing I hear from patients. They feel like their shoulder's out of the socket, but in reality it gets stuck on an arthritic spur. And, uh, they may have had a history of dislocations. It's a very common thing I see nowadays with patients who are in their mid-40s. They say, well, I used to dislocate my shoulder when I was 18, but it kind of stopped, and now my shoulder just hurts all the time. And you get an x-ray, and they have horrendous arthritis. And those patients are really unfortunate. So how do we image arthritis? So the most basic, obviously, imaging modality would be to x-ray. You can really tell a lot about a patient's arthritic condition through an x-ray. 
So MRIs in my practice are very rarely indicated in arthritis unless we're talking about a very young patient with mild arthritis and we're trying to quantify the degree of cartilage loss that they have. In my opinion, I don't think it's very cost effective to do MRIs on arthritic patients and, and I, these should probably be deferred to a specialist because there's a lot of things that we do that are nuanced and I'll talk about that in a minute where we can get a CAT scan and actually evaluate the anatomy of the shoulder and actually that helps plan uh, how we do shoulder replacements and that's a very specific protocol that many of us surgeons use. So I'd probably avoid doing that if you're going to refer to one of us. How do we treat these non-operatively? So this is the most important thing for everyone in this room. So generally, just like with any orthopedic problem, we try anti-inflammatories, modifying your activity, rest, cortisone injections, and we'll talk about how to do glenohumeral injections. I think that's very important. A hyaluronic acid, so visco supplementation has been FDA approved for the knee, but unfortunately it's not FDA approved for the shoulder, so that's an off-label treatment, which sometimes I'll try in younger patients that were trying to avoid surgery. In my opinion, it's probably not particularly effective, but it's something to try just to kind of kick the can down the road to avoid a shoulder replacement in younger patients. PRP, the jury's still out. I don't think it's particularly effective in arthritis. I think the most important thing is if you're going to send someone for physical therapy to work on gentle range of motion uh, restoration. Sometimes people go to therapy, they have arthritis, and the therapist cranks on their arm and it makes them worse, and then that makes the patients very unhappy, so we got to be careful there. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, glenohumeral cortisone injections, but um, uh, that's, uh, it's, it's important to distinguish between a glenohumeral and a subacromial cortisone injection. So a glenohumeral injection is an injection into the shoulder joint, and these are the most effective for patients with shoulder arthritis, not a rotator cuff injection. So how do we treat arthritis with surgery? There's lots of really fancy things we do other than shoulder replacements, but I'll give you a little um, insight into the trade. None of them really work that well. Um, we can do releases and debridement. We can take out the synovium. We can put in cadaver meniscus. We can resurface things. We can actually fuse the shoulder. Um, and patients like that do well, but it's a very narrow indication. But in reality, many of these procedures they just don't work as well as a shoulder replacement. And a lot of them are temporizing procedures that we've tried, and then maybe there's one study that shows that it works, and everybody starts incorporating. This is a classic thing that, orthopedic, that orthopedists love to do. They see one study, something works, and then everybody does it, and then five years later they realize it probably didn't work as well as we thought. So let's talk about total shoulder arthroplasty. So a total shoulder arthroplasty is where you replace the ball of the humerus with a metal ball and you resurface the, the socket with a plastic socket. So when, when do we do a total shoulder arthroplasty? We do them for patients with end-stage osteoarthritis. They have to have an intact rotator cuff and they have to have adequate bone stock. So we'll get into that in a second, but they have to have more or less reasonable bony anatomy that would accept a shoulder replacement without too much modification. So. Uh, I get questions about a hemiarthroplasty or partial shoulder replacement. So partial shoulder replacements in my practice are limited, um, where we don't resurface the socket. These in general are, relate, are uh, used for patients with avascular necrosis and maybe very young patients with osteoarthritis, mm -hmm. but this practice has been sort of falling by the wayside uh, in patients who are very young with osteoarthritis because they just don't generally do as well as patients with total shoulder arthroplasty. So if you have a young patient with arthritis, you do a hemiarthroplasty, they get maybe 50%, 60% pain relief for maybe 10 to 20 years, and a total shoulder is a slam dunk. So I think my, my practice has gravitated more towards total shoulders in younger patients that really need it. So what are the goals of a total shoulder? So we respect the anatomy, respect the soft tissues, release capsular adhesions, protect the nerves and, and uh, vascular structures, and protect the rotator cuff. So essentially we reestablish a pain-free, normally functional shoulder. So how do we do it? There's a lot of nuance, Not, none of that's important to you, but essentially there's a couple things that I think are important. We take one of the tendons called the subscapularis tendon off in the front and we have to repair it at the end. So a lot of the rehab is kind of focused on that. Um, and we replace the ball with a ball and a socket with a plastic socket. So the subscapularis repair is a key component to post-operative function. So I start, them on pa I start these patients on immediate stretching, so they're in a sling for protection, but they're stretching their arm right away. They're doing some light strengthening by six to 10 weeks. By, by 10 weeks, they're doing heavier strengthening, and by about four months, I really don't restrict them. I tell them I don't want them chopping wood, doing heavy impact exercises, doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but they can go back to golf, tennis, swimming, pretty much almost any activity is unrestricted, and these patients are very happy to do so. Um, so we protect the subscapularis patients who fall or patients who are shaking hands aggressively or get significant external rotation stretching and that tendon tears, they can become unstable and that's a big, big problem. So how do these patients do? They do great, um, quite frankly. They do phenomenally well. They have significant improvements which are very long lasting. They have great pain control and functional improvement. And the studies out there show that about 90% of them are lasting more than 20 years nowadays. And the, these patients, if you have them grade their shoulder, if you say, hey, if 100% is a normal shoulder, what would you grade their shoulder? They tell me that their shoulder is 95, 100% a lot of the time. So these patients really are very happy. The longevity of these implants really depends on the socket, though. The glenoid socket is probably the most important component in how we get a shoulder that lasts from 10 years to 25 years. 
So this is just an example of a patient of mine. She's about a year after a shoulder replacement. And if you look at these videos, what side do you think I replaced? How many think the right side? How many think the left side? Yes, yeah, so I replaced both sides, but this one, this video is before I replaced the right side. So, um, so this video is between her left and her right. So this is a left shoulder replacement, and, she, and she's, yeah, I kind of blacked out her face, but she's smiling behind that blue curtain there. Um, so she's got essentially full range of motion. Uh, she's got full rotation, both externally and internally. And she could pretty much go back to doing everything she wants. And subsequent to this video, I replaced her other shoulder. So what are the complications? They're disastrous, and they're not fun to deal with. And they happen uncommonly, but they happen. Things can loosen. You can get failure of the rotator cuff. You can have nerve injuries, instability, infection, fracture. You name it. I've seen it, and, and it's not pretty. But, but when they go well, they go well. And when they don't, they really don't. The most common thing I see, and the therapists ask me, that, that primary care physician ask me, well, what about some of these patients, they come to see me, they've had a total, and they're really stiff, they can't raise their arm. A lot of it, unfortunately, is a technical problem. So I usually tell patients, your motion is as good as it's ever going to be at time zero after surgery, and you've got to keep it that way. So patients, sometimes they come in to see me, and they really can't raise their arm. A lot of the times, it so has this to is do just an example of a patient of mine. Like She's about a year after a shoulder replacement. About a if you look at these videos, what sign um, do you think I replaced? Uh, sometimes it could be poor How many patient the right compliance, side? rehab program. There's a lot of things, overtension, uh, tendons. There's a lot of things that can lead to Yes, I replaced both, both sides, but this one, this video is and before I replaced the right side. shoulder on the left So this video is between her left and her right. This is a left shoulder replacement. If you restore the bony anatomy, I kind of blacked out her face. Within a smiling perfect behind circle that to hit the tuberosity and what's um, called So she's got essentially full range this, of These are the shoulders that are slam dunk shoulders. The ones like the middle one and the ones on the right are going to be very stiff because you over tension the rotator cuff, things fail, they dislocate. And this is probably one of the most common complications I see. And it's a technical factor that's unfortunately all too easy to avoid. And this sort of brings me to my next point, which is something has evolved in the last five years with how we do shoulder replacements. And there's been a, a huge aspect of computer planning that goes into this. So Every one of my patients that I do a shoulder replacement on gets a CAT scan, and we actually plug these values into a computer, and we target exactly the size of their implants, where they're going to go, completely custom to the patient. And it's actually, I think, made outcomes of shoulder replacements even better than I thought they could ever be. So this is just a case example. He's a 43-year-old electrician. He's had four previous shoulder operations. He lives on oxycodone. He barely can work, and he can't raise his arm probably above 70 degrees from the horizontal. So I used computer planning on him. He had a pretty significant deformity to the socket. A lot of technical things that aren't important, but this is him at a year after surgery. This is his left shoulder. He could barely raise his arm to 70 degrees, and now he's got essentially, I think, full range of motion. He's back to plumbing, which I'm not thrilled about because he's spending a lot of time overhead, and he's completely off pain medication. So th these surgeries, when they're done well, I think, in my opinion, are a slam dunk on these patients. So let's talk about reverse shoulder replacement. So, so what is a reverse shoulder replacement? I get this question a lot, like, what the heck are you going to do? You're going to switch the components of my shoulder, and the ball's going to go here, and the socket's going to go there? Well, essentially what you do is exactly that. You put a ball where the socket goes, and you put a socket where the ball goes. And the way that that works is basically, as you remember, I was mentioning when the rotator cuff has failed, the shoulder basically, as you elevate it, the shoulder will, will sort of dislocate out the front. And this is now a constrained prosthesis that translates the deltoid force from the shoulder going up to actually an elevating force. So it converts a shear force to a compressive force. So it's kind of neat. It's a pretty brilliant design out of France. And we used to just have, all we would be able to do with these patients is do a partial shoulder replacement. And largely, they did terribly. Now, with the reverse shoulder replacement, we've really been able to treat a lot of complicated problems in the shoulder very, very well. So this is just a picture. I mean, internalize this in your head. That's on the left. That's a total shoulder. Ball where the ball is, socket where the socket is, and on the right, Socket where the ball goes and ball where the socket goes. That's why it's called a reverse. So us orthopedists, we're not very smart. We like to think about things very linearly. So what are the indications for reverse total shoulder? So in my practice, reverse total shoulders are done for massive tears of the rotator cuff with arthritis, rotator cuff arthritis. And then now we've started talking about patients with severe bone loss or revised revising total shoulders and elderly patients and patients were expanding the indications as we go. Um, so this is just an example of sort of what a reverse shoulder replacement looks like. We cut the ball, you see on the right. On the left, you'll see that there's really essentially no rotator cuff present on the top. So the, the ball is completely bare. And this guy is a 67-year-old ex-firefighter who came to me with severe rotator cuff arthritis. And basically, you'll see here on the left, there's the ball, and then you replace it with a socket. It's a little hard to see because of the lights. And then what I was able to do for cases like his, and for pretty much all my cases, is I use these computer-navigated tools that are three-dimensionally printed in Indiana, and they come to me, and I can actually target exactly where the reverse goes so I can maximize their range of motion based on computer simulating technology. 
And then this is what I want to see in all my patients. So once, once you do the reverse, I test their range of motion. This is after the components are in. And I say, all right, how, do, how good does this look? So I can get pretty much full range of motion. The prosthesis seems stable. It's not dislocating. And I say to myself, this guy's going to be really happy. And then this is his, um, his computer plan you'll see on the right. So I can actually simulate where these reverses go. And then on the left, I think I did a pretty nice job trying to replicate that computer program. And this is how he does. This is only three months after surgery. So he doesn't have full range of motion yet. But... But, I mean, he is really, really doing well. And he's back to golf, tennis, all those kind of things that he likes to do in retirement. And he's extremely happy with how he's doing. So these patients do well also. How do they rehab? Sling for six weeks. We start them on some stretching, and then we get them moving faster. So how do these patients do long term? Well, we don't really know because we haven't been doing them for more than 20 years, at least in the States. But generally, these patients do extremely well, and their outcomes are pretty well sustained. And there's a lot of studies that are out there that are showing that reverses do pretty much as well as total shoulders, except for some subtle. Uh, rotational deformities, like rotating behind their back. So this is just an example of, a, uh, of the difference in my practice that, that has been. The guy on the left is a guy who did a reverse on probably right when I started practice. And then as I've started doing these computer simulated models to try to maximize their range of motion, you'll see the guy on, on the left had a reverse replacement probably about seven, maybe six years ago. The one on the right had a left shoulder, re reverse shoulder replacement done maybe about a year ago. So his range of motion is full and the range of motion on the guy on the left is maybe good but not perfect. And I think allowing us to do these computer simulated programs uh, has gotten patients from going maybe 80% to 95 to 100%. It's a, it's a total slam dunk. So complications, again, when complications happen, they're not great. And so we have to be mindful of that. And just, just one other case example of a patient who came to me with a failed total shoulder. So reverses have been sort of used in our armamentarium to, to, to basically allow us to revise previous failed operations. And they tend to do very well. So this is a patient who came to me with a subscapularis failure. Their shoulder was dislocated. I revised them, put a reverse in, and three months later, she's, she's doing pretty well. And we can actually use, the, the final slide I'll talk about is we can actually use uh, reverse shoulder replacements for complicated fractures in, in elderly patients especially. And so you'll see on the left, we, we can treat fractures with open reduction, plates and screws. We can treat it with partial replacements, which by and large has kind of fallen out of favor. And then reverse shoulder replacements can be used really, really well with extreme reliability on patients with severe fractures, especially elderly patients. And patients who might have been treated before with, um, with either conservative management or plate and screws and maybe gotten their arm to raise above more or less the horizontal. This is a 92-year-old lady. She does Pilates. She had an extreme shoulder fracture. This was about six weeks after her fracture when she came to see me. It wasn't showing any signs of healing. And she was pretty unhappy, so I did a reverse shoulder replacement, and this was her at about six months after surgery. She had essentially rest restoration of a good amount of range of motion. It's her left shoulder. She's certainly not perfect. Got a little bit of a ways to go, but she's 92. And uh, she, this is a slam dunk. I mean, she is so happy. She's doing everything she wants to do. And when she came to me, she was essentially pseudo-paralytic, about 20 degrees forward elevation. So, so these operations have really, we can tailor how, pa how, how patients do. And, and, and these, the expanding indications of some of these operations have really allowed me to make patients go from sort of OK to, to superb. And I think a lot of patients come to me and they say, well, I've been told I have a fracture. I have arthritis. I'll never raise my arm above the horizontal. And I tell them, uh, not here. <laughs> so, so I think it's been a very rewarding part of my practice. And uh, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Yes, in the front. Okay, I guess we're stretching. Anybody else? Dr. Whitting. Yes. Sure. So impingement, is, as, uh, as Dr. Epstein was mentioning, is basically pinching of the rotator cuff underneath the acromion bone. And I think the tricky part is that sometimes patients who come in to the clinic with arthritis can present like they have impingement. So I think the biggest differences between impingement and arthritis uh, probably rely in two tests. The first one is what's their range of motion? So generally patients with impingement have full range of motion and when you take your arm and, and you internally rotate it, they get a pinch pain in the back because you're squeezing the rotator cuff underneath the acromion bone and they'll maybe get some pain with forward elevation whereas typically patients who present with arthritis, the first thing I'll do is I'll say raise your arm and they might not have full range of motion. 
They might have positive impingement tests. Actually, in fact, I'd probably say most of them, if not all of them, have positive impingement tests. So you squeeze their arm in the back, they have pain, but that's because you're stretching the inner lining or the capsule of the shoulder, and they're arthritic and stiff, so they'll have pain reminiscent of an impingement test. But I think probably the most easy thing to do is I'll take their arm, and I'll put their, their elbow at their side, and I'll forcibly externally rotate their arm. So that's called an anterior capsular stretch maneuver. So you're stretching the front of the capsule or the inner lining of the shoulder, and as you stretch it, they'll have quite a bit of pain, and that's usually uh, positive either in someone who has frozen shoulder, so capsular inflammation, but it's very common in patients who have arthritis. So as, I take my, as they take their arm and I rotate it with their elbow in and they have significant amounts of pain, that's a capsular stretch maneuver, and I think mm -hmm. patients who have impingement rarely have positive pain on capsular stretch, whereas patients with arthritis or frozen shoulder and they present similar will have pain on capsular stretch testing. In terms of injections, so um, this, is, this, this is just my preference how I do it. When I do a subacromial injection or an injection basically where you're injecting around the rotator cuff, I tend to do it posteriorly and I aim right underneath the acromion. We'll talk about this in the breakout session, but a subacromial injection goes above the rotator cuff underneath the acromion. And that's generally uh, reserved for patients with impingement and rotator cuff pathology. Patients who have arthritis, it's important to inject inside the joint. So they don't have a rotator cuff problem, they have a problem inside their joint. So with whatever way you're gonna inject their shoulder, you wanna get the medicine inside their joint. I think without an ultrasound, and I've tried, I've experimented with and without ultrasound, and probably the easiest way to do it without an ultrasound is to go from anterior. You localize the coracoid, you put your finger and you take one finger breath medially and one finger breath anteriorly, and you'll actually palpate on your own shoulder if anyone wants to try it. There's a little soft spot. So your coracoid, excuse me, not medially, laterally. So the coracoid is the bone that's sitting right in front of your shoulder blade. It's a little dot bone that sits right on the front and you can feel it in your own shoulder. And if you take your finger and you bring it one centimeter laterally and one centimeter slightly inferiorly and then you, and then you feel a, a soft spot right there, that's the easiest way to get into the shoulder. And I'll explain that a little bit more in our breakout sessions. But that is, I think, very important when you're injecting patients either with frozen shoulder, so capsular problems inside the shoulder or arthritis. Yes. So, so conservative treatment for arthritis, it's interesting. Of all, we don't walk on our shoulders. And so the majority of people who have shoulder arthritis do not choose and probably aren't really, frankly, candidates for shoulder replacement unless they've tried everything. So conservative management is really important. So before you necessarily need to send someone with, well, with arthritis to go see someone for a shoulder replacement, I think conservative management is ideal for many of these patients. So anti-inflammatories, gentle stretching exercises, having them maybe modify some of their overhead activities, especially if their arthritis is mild, almost always makes them better, or at least to the point where it's tolerable. And most of these patients will do very well with a very conservative regime. Trying a glenohumeral cortisone injection that we can practice later, I think that's, that's very helpful in the office. Um, so before you necessarily re have to refer these patients out, having them modify their activities, getting them on a good anti-inflammatory, doing some very light stretching, even if you want to send them to physical therapy, just making mention that you don't want the therapist to do anything extreme or aggressive, especially if they had carry the diagnosis of arthritis, I think is very appropriate and seeing how they respond. And oftentimes patients respond very well and they say, you know what, this is doing pretty well for me. I'll kind of kick the can down the road. I don't really want to do anything about it just yet. So that's probably about 80 to 90% of patients that I end up seeing in the office are treated extremely well with that um, with that type of treatment yes so I get that question a lot that's a very good question so how often should these patients be getting cortisone injections um, and this is probably true in all different aspects of orthopedics there's no real great literature that drives us from an evidence-based standpoint as to when we should be doing these injections or how often patients should be getting injections um, I think in ge the general rules that I tend to follow are if you're not getting relief for more than a couple weeks you probably shouldn't be getting tons of injections so I try to space my injections out no less than every three months and try to keep it to maximum of three injections a year but the reality is that these patients the first injection they get typically works great. 
The second injection doesn't work as well. The third injection doesn't work as well. And then usually by the third, you kind of know that there's a problem. So if they get a year's worth of relief from a cortisone injection and they disappear and they come back and say, oh, wow, this injection helped for about a year, I'd say you have no problem. Let's do another one, kick the can down the road. But if you start seeing them and they're getting multiple injections a year, three, four injections a year, and they're barely even squeaking through between those injections, to me, that's a big problem. So I think you have to be careful with too much cortisone because number one, it can increase the risk of local osteoporosis, increases the risk of colonization of bacteria, whether it's an active infection or sort of a, quote, inactive infection. And it can also cause problems to the rotator cuff. So rotator cuff tendons can get fibrotic and they can be more susceptible to tearing. So we have to be really careful about that. Yes. Or cortisone. So I often give a mix of both. So in, in my practice, I'll give six cc's of 1% lidocaine and 80 milligrams of Kenalog. So some patients you get, or some orthopedists and other primary care doctors use Depomedrol, Kenalog. I like to use a crystalline-based um, cortisone because I think their release characteristics tend to be a little bit more slow-acting and they tend to last longer than a medication like dexamethasone. But almost always I'm doing lidocaine mixed with cortisone. I think the most important thing is if you're doing a cortisone injection and you're putting in two cc's of fluid into the joint, you're not really distending it enough to spread it around. So oftentimes, it, I think it's important to actually mix the, that one or two cc of cortisone with at least four or five cc's of lidocaine because then it distends the joint. And even if you're not perfectly in the joint, it'll at least get to the area. If you're only putting in two cc's into the joint, you have to be right on the money. Um, so, putting, so mixing it with lidocaine and shaking it up, I think, is important. Yes. That's a good question. Uh, it's uncommon, I've seen it, um, but you can mix it with normal saline if you want to. But I do think it's important to mix it with something to increase the volumetric uh, amount of, of injectable that you're putting in their shoulder. Okay, thanks, everybody. thanks very much, everybody.